Welcome to our second Naturalist Night of 2020. This is a 10-week free speaker series um, in the Roaring Fork Valley, hosted by a partnership between the Wilderness Workshop and the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies, um, as well as Roaring Fork Audubon. Um, next, so these are every week here at ACES. They're on Thursdays at 6 p.m. And then on Wednesdays, they're in Carbondale at 6 p.m. Um, and they are every week through mid-March. Um, these are hosted and sponsored by um, Aspen Skiing Company. They provide a lot of financial support for this presentation um, and they cover travel expenses for our speakers and a lot of other things. Um, these presentations are aired on Grassroots TV on Channel 12 Up Valley and Channel 82 Down Valley. Videos will be available on our organization's websites and on social media in the coming weeks. We'll also stream uh, both of these talks Wednesdays and Thursdays um, on the Wilderness Workshop and on ACES Facebook pages. Um, next week's presentation is going to be by Paul Milhauser, titled Disappearing Elk, Loving Our Wild Places to Death. So that'll be happening next week. And then for today, we want to welcome Amy Seglund and Erin Yappert. Amy is a seasoned wildlife biologist that has worked in a variety of ecosystems. Since 2011, she has studied alpine species, including the white-tailed ptarmigan, American pika, and most recently, the brown-capped rosy finch. And Aaron is a wildlife biologist with a passion for birds and conserving wild spaces. He has spent the last few years studying avian behavior in the field and has been a part of the Rosie Finch Project since 2017. And these guys are going to present um, their presentation. And we would like to give them a big round of applause and welcome them. Well, good evening. Thanks for having us come and speak about the brown cap Rosie Finch, the bird in the left hand of this slide. It is an inhabitant of the alpine habitats. Having, having you all here from Aspen, you're probably real familiar with alpine habitats. It's everything pretty much above tree line. So in this picture on the left, um, you can see this is all kind of alpine potential habitat for the brown-capped rosy finch. And as you all are probably aware, again, being from Aspen, we have a lot of alpine habitat in Colorado. So we're extremely, extremely lucky. So hopefully you enjoy our little presentation about what we've learned about brown-capped rosy finches. So I work for Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and um, you may wonder why we even started getting interested in brown cap rosy finches, why we wanted to start a research project. And we identified it in our state wildlife action plan. We kind of prioritize species that we want to work on, ones that we think are, um, may have some issues going on with populations or nesting or breeding areas. And so we identified the brown cap rosy finch basically because we had n very little information on this bird. It's almost endemic to the state of Colorado, as I'll show you in the next slide with our range map. And we just had very little information, basically because they live in these really high alpine habitats that can be really difficult to, at to access. The, re the, reasons, the other reasons that we were concerned about it is climate change. We're always concerned what might go on in the alpine areas that might impact this bird due to climate change, warming, changing in snow conditions snow turning to rain at certain times of the period of the year. Um, there's also a, mount, a big amount of sheep grazing that goes on in the Alpine as well as some of the areas where they winter, so that was of concern. And then just the growing population in Colorado and some human disturbance, what kind of impact that would have on the species. So this is the range of the brown-capped rosy finch, and like I said, it's almost endemic to the state of Colorado. So this is its range. The blue is where it winters. This orangish color is where it breeds. So you can see it's much more restricted in the breeding season. It expands its range altitudinally in the winter, so it drops down in elevation. Most of you have seen them at your bird feeders. They can drop down to find food sources in winter, but they're much more restricted during the breeding season. And this is the only place that this bird occurs. As you can see, it goes up a little bit into the snowy range in Wyoming, drops a little bit into Me to New Mexico, but there's very few breeding pairs down there, so it's pretty much a bird for Colorado. So with our project, knowing that this bird may be difficult to study, we wanted to start with some simple questions. One, what is our population size? Can we even get an estimate of how many birds occur in Colorado? And does that population look like it's pretty healthy, or does it look like it's pretty small and we may need to start doing some management for the species? And then if we can get a baseline, is that population, can we then measure it into the future? Is it stable? Is it growing? Or is it declining? Again, kicking us into developing some management strategies. 
And then we wanted to get to know a little bit about the bird. As I said, we know very, very little about it. So we wanted to look at some life history components. Basically, where is it sh selecting to nest? What do the nest sites look like? Also, what is the genetic structure of the bird? Is there good gene flow between populations or are some very isolated and adapted to certain areas? So we wanted to get some information on genetic structure. <laughs> and then just basically movement. I was talking earlier before this presentation started you know, some people say, I get this many birds at our feeder at this time of year and not at this time of year. We just wanted to maybe delve into the question of how are these birds moving through the landscape? So they aren't all simple questions, but this is kind of what we outlined to start with. Kind of a big endeavor, actually. So we knew that we needed to look at the bird throughout the year. We wanted to look at it during the breeding season because at that time it's more of a stable population because you have a male defending a nest site that has a female and so they stay in that one spot so you can go out and maybe count them look at distribution so that's a good time of year to look at population size it's also of course where we're going to look at nesting nesting success where are they putting nests and potentially fledging success and then in winter because we have this erratic movements erratic up and down elevational movements and differences in flock uh, at flocks and how they use the landscape, we thought we could get at movement. We can also capture them during the winter time. We've tried to capture them in the summer. There's too much food. They don't really care about sunflower seeds in the summer. But in winter, <laughs> as you all know, they go into those traps and love the sunflower seeds that you feed them. So that was the time we could capture them and band them. Also collect genetic samples like feathers. So we moved. So these are the two different. Um, uh, seasons that we're going to investigate the bird. And I'm just going to introduce some of the winter survival strategies and then Aaron's going to talk about the winter research because he's basically been the one in charge of that and overseeing it. But just to give you a background, I mean this is a bird that weighs 29 grams, you know, 32 grams if it's wet. So it's a very small passerine and how does it survive living in the high alpine where it stays until winter, until snowstorms can push them down to lower elevations? How does it survive in these harsh environments? Well, one important element for their survival, especially in winter, is that they have a good roost site. They need to get into some kind of cover, like in a cliff or a cave or an old building, so that they can get out of the inclement weather. They also will go in there in a flock so that they can huddle together so they can reduce the amount of energy they expend during those very cold nights. I mean, we've recorded temperatures in Gunnison, you're talking negative 30 degrees and they have to survive those overnight temperatures. This, um, for me, I've been looking a little bit of some of the native landscapes where they go. Most of you are probably familiar with the bird feeders, but around Montrose, this is where they go to feed in the salt desert scrub area. These are the flocks of rosy finches that I've encountered. This is a big flock. This is a big flock. And they come down when we get snow in Montrose, a storm up high, and they'll come down and they just go into these feeding frenzies. So you can have a matte salt bush, get a group of birds on there, and they'll just denude that bush. They eat everything in sight and then they're gone. So um, they need to do this. They need to eat and they act ravenous so that they can build body fat during the day. They can increase their weight by seven to 10 percent during the day, which they lose at night and then have to start all over. So these sites are very important to rosy finches besides the bird feeders. So this is another flock that's actually landed to feed in Montrose. They only stay on these steep slopes. And this is what it looks like when the snow goes away. Big difference. And some of the concern I have for some of these native wintering areas is that this gets hammered by sheep grazing in winter. So when the sheep go in there, they can denude those plants of seed source for the birds. So that can limit their, them using these areas. And also when we had that severe drought in 2018, none of these, none of these bushes or plants had any seeds. So I, didn't, I only saw the birds come down once that year. So drought and sheep grazing on these native winter landscapes can be potentially detrimental to the bird. And I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron because he's our species expert for the winter stuff. Thank you, Amy. Um, so as she mentioned, oftentimes when we encounter rosy finches, it's at these bird feeders and they come in these huge flocks. Sometimes it's as low as 25 birds, but other days you can get four or five, 600 birds coming in at one time. And we saw this as an opportunity to really look at the species in the winter 
it op offered an opportunity to catch these birds um, in ways that we couldn't at any other time of year. So our winter banding efforts, we were looking at two major things here, as Amy mentioned, the regional movements of these birds, where are they going from day to day, as well as the genetic diversity component of this species. So do we have any structure to our population? Are isolated breeding regions genetically different than those in the contiguous central Rockies? So we wanted to explore those two primary objectives. We're also looking at a few other things, such as bill color transition. These birds have an interesting bill transformation pattern through the summer and the winter, which I'll talk more about. We also wanted to explore things like male-female sex ratio and age distributions. Are these flocks biased towards an age or a sex, um, or is it just a random mix of birds, and how does that hierarchy play out um, in their survival? So to evaluate these things, we did the traditional um, bird banding methods here. So we have a federally issued aluminum leg band, and this goes on the right leg in the winter, left leg in the summer. It's got a unique nine digit number on it. So each bird gets its own band, gets its own band number, and we can track that bird if we ever recatch it. We can say, oh, we banded this one on February 2nd, 2017 in Ridgeway or something along that line. Additionally, we regionally assigned a color and so at our banding sites within a given region, we applied that specific color um, with the goal of enhancing our movement understanding here. So we can see that, ah, we've got a purple bird. That means we banded it in Ridgeway and we resaw it in Gunnison. And we can now track that movement visually without having to directly recapture that bird. So it allows not only us as researchers to follow those birds, but citizen scientists like you who might have a bird feeder with Rosie Finch's, Rosie Finch's coming in. So we've had tens, if not hundreds of reports of banded birds across the state um, from just random home, homeowners who are you know, interested in looking out at their birds and they say, yeah, that one's got a red band on it. Where'd that come from? And we're able to get in touch with them and see what, where that bird came from. So here's some photos from our banding efforts. Um, we're primarily banding at private homes. So each one's a little different. Sometimes we're in the garage here um, and these are some of our people involved. And then occasionally we're outside, kind of toughing it on some days, other days it's quite nice. Um, and then here's a, uh, these are our birds hanging in their bags waiting to be processed. So oftentimes we catch, you know, 10 to 15 birds and we can't obviously process them instantly. So they hang them in bags here and that's kind of the standard bird banding practice. And then as soon as we've done our work with them, off they go, away and free, and they usually give a squawk of uh, lack of appreciation. Um, so we use these green traps here, so they're walk-in traps, and our typical setup might look something like this as the birds are visiting. So we have eight or so traps, and they've got, we have a door, they'll, we'll bait them with sunflower seeds, and then the birds will say, oh, that looks tasty, walk on in, they step on the treadle, the door comes down and quite frequently they don't even realize they're caught until the rest of the flock flies away and they say, wait a minute, something's not right here. Um, and then we'll check our traps every, you know, 10 or 15 minutes, depending on how often the flock is present and go get those birds and pull them out. Um, so that's kind of what our typical banding setup looks like. And then once we've caught the birds, what do we do? So rosy finches, brown cap rosy finches are sexually dimorphic, so you can separate the males from the females. So on the right there, we've got the nice male. You can see that bright pink in the belly and in the wings, and then that nice brown color on the chest. And here on the left is a female. They're much more drab. They don't have that bright coloration. And so one of the first things we'll do is we'll age and sex them. Oftentimes we're looking at feather coloration, so this bright pink um, is a good indicator of an older male, and then some of these other birds can be much more drab, and then we see those as younger females. So once we've established that, we'll take some measurements. We often look at wing cord, so that's you know, the length of the wing, and that helps us gauge the size of the bird, so we can kind of standardize across different sized birds, because there's some difference there. And then the two things we're really interested in are the fat deposits on the bird, and the mass, and those give us an indication of the bird's condition when we've caught it. So birds primarily store fat for maybe the next 24 or 48 hours. So it's a short-term thing that they use to get through the next day. So 
early on in the day. We often see that birds, especially in Gunnison where it's extremely cold, if we catch a bird at maybe 8, or 8 a.m., their fat deposits are often very, very low. They might not have any at all. And then by 11 or noon, we're starting to see birds that have you know, really built up some nice fat stores. And those are those feeding frenzies that Amy's talking about. They're really crucial for these guys to um, survive in the short term. So beyond those measures, we also want to explore that genetic structure component here. So this is a range map of uh, viable rosy finch habitat in the state of Colorado. And what we can see here is we have some isolated areas of breeding habitat. You know, this area down in the San Juans around Telluride is fairly isolated from the central Rockies. And then there's some areas in the flat tops and up north that are fairly separate, as well as Pikes Peak here, which is an interesting little island. And so we're interested to see if these separate breeding areas, if birds caught in those regions have different genomes than the birds caught um, elsewhere in the state. And that just gives us a big picture idea of how these birds may or may not be interacting and if there is any breeding isolation, which is a big component for conservation land managers. So to do that, we take a feather sample. We pull one of their tail feathers. It doesn't hinder their flight, their balance, or anything that makes a rosy finch a rosy finch. And with that, we're able to evaluate their genome and determine the population's genetic diversity and structure. So additionally, we have that local and regional movements component. So these are some birds with bands on it. You can see this black band here, and there's that federal aluminum. And then this bird's getting a purple band. So what we did was we assigned a color code to each region in the state. Um, and then these stars represent our banding sites. So we have all the way up in the north in Estes Park, one outside Fair Play. This is Gunnison, Colorado. And then we have three in the Telluride Ridgeway area there. And so we've been able to spread these out and see, um, apply different colors. And so some of the dispersal events we've uncovered through this method, we've seen birds travel from Ridgeway to Telluride fairly frequently. That's a pretty short distance. And in some cases they've done, we've seen that dispersal in as few as four days. Um, some of our longer ones, birds have gone from Gunnison to Ridgeway, which is crossing that fairly large gap of isolated habitat, which were, is interesting and provides maybe a potentially, potential link between those regions. We've seen Gunnison to Tennessee Pass, one of our longer ones. And then our longest thus far was a bird that was banded in Estes Park. We re-caught in Ridgeway, um, which is close to 200 miles. And that kind of starts to span the entire range of these birds in the state. As well, we've had a sighting on the West Cliff Christmas bird count last year. Um, unfortunately, the photo, we weren't able to determine the band color, but to at least the nearest site, that's you know nearly 80 miles. And from this year, we have a bird that was seen in, um, in Colorado Springs, just outside Garden of the Gods, and that bird was banded in Gunnison. So what these things are telling us, and two of the more interesting ones, are that West Cliff sighting, which is here, kind of on the uh, east side of the Sangre de Cristos, and then our Gunnison to Colorado Springs bird, which is here. Um, these are two very interesting reports because if we look at our range map, again, West Cliff and, and Colorado Springs, those are fairly isolated breeding regions. And we're seeing birds in the, at least from one winter to another, moving into those areas. And now what we're interested in understanding is are those birds staying in those breeding regions or do they move again to somewhere else. And that's providing a pretty important link between those populations. And it allows us to, we're starting to see that there is potential for these birds to move long distances. We don't really know how frequent it is. We don't know if it's whole flocks that are moving from Estes Park down south, or is, is it just one bird that's kind of jumping from flock to flock along the way. But we're beginning to understand that these birds do move quite a long way and that the birds that you might have in Aspen in, you know, say December may not be the same birds that you have in Aspen in April. And that provides some good information for our conservation interests in that we, it, it, it may be important to conserve large areas of their habitat. So as I mentioned, some of our secondary objectives here, this is their bill morphology and transition. So these birds in the breeding season, especially the males, have a dark black bill. 
And what we find is that in the early fall, they transition to a nearly entirely yellow bill. So this bird here on the left represents what is their, say, uh, early December bird. And it's got just this little black tip, and then the rest is yellow. And then as time progresses, those birds start to turn more and more black. This last photo on the right kind of represents a bird in say late February. And then if we took, if I had a photo from say late April, that bird would be jet black. We know this is tied to sexual selection. So it's a breeding season trait that males have developed over time, but we don't understand why it's advantageous for the birds to transition back to yellow in the fall. It seems intuitively, it seems like a lot of energy to change the color of your bill. And especially in the winter, right? You know, you're, it's negative 30 in Gunnison and you're working on, you know, how black your bill is. But it's not always this predictable pattern. This bird opted for racing stripes. Um, and it's also interesting that the left side of the bill is not always the same as the right side. So it's this kind of unique transition amongst birds. Most passerines don't do anything like this. Um, and it's just one of those things, we had these birds in hand, we felt like we should document it and maybe, you know, hypothesize on what use it is. But our research has not been smooth sailing. We've had a lot of difficulties. One of our primary questions that we set out to answer was adult survival in the winter. So we wanted to understand how many birds were dying in the winter, in any given winter, and how many were surviving, you know, across winters. Um, and this, of course, would provide a lot of information as to how quickly we need to manage these birds, what their survival looks like, where are the key points in their life cycle that they're dying. But to do that, we need to recatch birds. You know, the fancy statistics says that you need to recatch a certain number of your birds that you've banded, and we really struggled to do that. You know, we might band two or 300 birds in a day at a site, and by the afternoon, you might see 10 bands in the flock. And over time, that number just keeps getting less and less, and we struggled to meet those statistical demands. Additionally, and this was very concerning, is we noticed ice accumulating on the bands. So this, this bird here has the most severe icing we've seen thus far, and we've seen a few other um, incidences here. And this, of course, was a big concern, right? We're trying to study these birds, we're trying to address their survival, we're trying to help them as a species, and we're potentially having a significant impact on their day-to-day -day lives. So along with that icing and our banding, we noticed some behavioral changes. These birds were often lifting their legs and, and kind of tucking them up towards their body, which we interpreted as them wanting to warm that leg because their band was very cold. Um, we also saw some peck at their bands and then of course the ice. So with that in mind and our, so between our low recaptures, the icing, these behavior changes, we eliminated band application. We said, this is not something that we're comfortable doing. We don't know what kind of impact we're having on the individual birds, and we don't know what impact we have on our statistical analysis. So with that in mind, we shifted our focus. Because we had put out close to 2,000 bands on these birds, we had this unique opportunity to study what our bands were doing to these birds, right? So we wanna take this opportunity to understand the impacts of banding, and to do that, we wanna evaluate individual health and condition, right? So if we recapture a bird, it's got a band on it, we can evaluate its fat and its body condition and compare that with an unbanded bird we caught on the same day or the same time. And then we can do a direct comparison to say, are these banded birds, do they have lower fat? Are they have a lower, lower mass? What kind of impact are we having there? And we can understand that based on our sites. Like maybe Gunnison, because it's so cold there, has a greater impact on these birds than somewhere that's a bit more mild. And then additionally, we've added a behavioral observation component. So now we're focusing on these individual banded birds. We're following them as they're feeding, and we're looking at how many times they lift their leg, how many times they might peck at their band. Do they have any ice? And if so, what? To, to what degree. And ultimately, you know, we're really interested in conducting good science, but ethical science. So we don't want to put these birds at risk in ways that, you know, 
aren't beneficial to them. So if we're not gaining the information that we need, we need to address our methods and that's what we hope to have done here. And with that in mind, we also wanted to develop protocols that address some of those breeding season questions that Amy talked about, as well as you know develop some stronger ideas about what they're doing in that breeding season where we feel like we can study these birds without directly impacting an individual um, beyond just looking at them through binoculars. So Amy's going to elaborate more on what those breeding season surveys look, season surveys look like, and she'll take it from here. Thanks, Aaron. Um, just one thing I wanted to say about the ice and bands that Aaron said last night, but didn't mention last night. It's a very rare occurrence. I mean, we've only you only see it in certain cold wet conditions it doesn't ha it happens very rarely so just to mention that just the aluminum bands yep yep um so we're going to move on to the summer breeding surveys which are a fun survey to do i really enjoy them i since i was doing pikas and, Al and ptarmigan i couldn't give up on the alpine so that's why i'm doing rosy finches but the first thing we wanted to do was see, we had modeled the habitat for where the rosy finch occurred, and we wanted to look at distribution. So we just wanted to go out and sample and look at presence, absence of birds across the landscape. Are there certain areas that they're not occurring and others that they do occur? And then we wanted to go further in depth and look at density, how many birds occupy a certain area. And if they're occupying that area, why is there a higher density over here and a lower density over here? So we're gonna characterize those breeding sites and see if we can correlate some kind of variable to describe why there's higher densities. And then we wanted to locate some nests just because very few nests have been located and we just wanna kinda of understand their nesting behavior a little bit more. So this is breeding habitat. They breed at the highest elevations of any bird. I thought ptarmigans like to breed really high elevations. Well, I, ptarmigans would be down here, so I had to keep hiking up the hill to get to rosy finches. They like to be in those cliffs and those rocks, so they're very, very high elevational breeders. This is beautiful alpine habitat, and you might run into a ptarmigan here, but this isn't gonna work for rosy finches just because it lacks the rock and cliff structure. So in this area, I would not think that I would ever find a rosy finch, or if it was, it would probably be lost. So they don't really use those really green areas with no cliff structure. So when we modeled the habitat we kept that in mind so that green area is alpine habitat everything above 11,500 feet and we inter intersected it with a cliff layer so we only sampled stuff um, areas that were in 500 meters of a cliff so that is what our green modeled habitat is and this map on the left hand side and from that we selected random plots that were four by four kilometers in size and those are these purple areas across the state so we tried to sample everywhere within the modeled range as you can see in Pitkin County you guys actually have quite a few survey plots that we did does anybody recognize this one I'm sure you all been there up, Lost Lake yep up there on Independence Pass so that was one of our sample plots beautiful up there lots of rosy finches so this is the Lost Lake Basin so what we did, because we couldn't cover a whole four by four kilometer plot, within that plot area, we selected certain basins to sample. So you can see what we defined a basin is just basically where the water drains from that area. So this would be a basin. This could potentially be a basin right here. And this is the Lost Lake Basin. So within each of those plots, we randomly selected a basin to sample. And the basins, as you can see here, this one's huge. This one's little, so that varied in size on what we were sampling. And what we did is we tried to walk transects, two people walking transects within the basin area. We'd start at about 7.30 a.m. Rosy finches, we found, don't like to wake up very early, unlike a lot of other birds. They like to wake till it warms up and the insects get moving. So we'd start surveys about 7.30 a.m. One person would try and walk as high as they could. This is all this steep topography, as high as they could under the cliffs and the other person would try and walk as low as they could, kind of more in the, the tundra green area to, to find birds feeding. 
And basically what we did is we walked those line, what I'm gonna call line transects and counted all the pairs or birds that we came across. And from that, we can come up with a density estimate. I'm not gonna get into all the statistics or anything, but that's what we did when we sampled those basins. So this is a big basin. This is in the Cimarron Mountains. This is me, I'm trying to get up high. It takes a lot of work. And then I have to walk as high as I can around the lower person's gonna kind of stay below the rock and sample. Um, this picture is from 2018. Notice very little snow and we sampled this like early July. Um, so it was a very, very dry year, very hot year. But basically, yes, that's how we sampled these basins. Um, this basin, we sampled this is August. So this is in 2019 after the historic snow and it took us two times to try and get into this basin. But um, here, this person, one of my volunteers, oops, ah, sorry the wrong button. One of my volunteers is trying to get up high to start some of the surveys. So that was, we did go run across a lot of different conditions each year and we're going to go again this year so we'll see what we have to deal with. So this is just showing you how high we try and get. This is my graduate student that's working on the brown crap rosy finch, Kat Bernier. She gave a talk here last year. So it is a little sketchy on hiking and it's very tiring and you got to watch for rocks and all kinds of stuff, but it's super fun when you see the birds. And then as well as doing those um, surveys, we go out and characterize. We also select random points within a basin to characterize what I call the biotic and abiotic factors. So the biotic being, you know, how much grass, forb, shrub cover there is, what is the makeup of the forb composition, and then the abiotic is what's the cliff structure, what does the rocky areas look like, is it scree, is it talus, so that again we can correlate the number of birds we're seeing in basin with these habitat characteristics. And so this is another technician collecting that veg data. And you know, we fin finish about noon and I have to say it was a lot of hard work but I really enjoyed my lunch hour. So I uh, love looking out at that country. But now we're going to kind of go into some of the lessons that we learned during our surveys in the summer. We were, surprisingly enough, which I wasn't sure we'd find any nests, we did find seven nests, eight nests. Um, one was in a talus rock pile, which was really interesting. The rest were kind of what we would consider a crevice in, uh, in a rock crevice. Um, they do lay about four eggs, and they only um, Give, they only have one clutch. So adult survival is very important because you're only talking about maybe four um, young hatching and we don't know what the fledgling survival is. So you would think that the adults need to have high survival to keep the population going. This is um, a nest that we found and it was kind of interesting that they use some sheep fur to make their nest. They like to use mud and roots and grasses to make these nests. And how we found most of our nests were in 2018 when we could go up there early enough, watch the female building them. You just watch her, she grabs some material, flies into the nest hole and flies out while her mate just flies around and you know watches her. He doesn't do anything. She's the only one that works. So there we go again. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, she works really hard and makes very lovely nests. So this is an example of a nest. I don't know if you can see it. And I was really shocked because I actually didn't think they would make them this low to the ground. Um, and we probably found the nests that were low to the ground because we could find them. I'm sure they make them a lot higher in the cliffs that we weren't able to find. This was the one I found in the talus slope. So it's this huge, huge pile of rocks, but there was just this beautiful little hole and she would go in and out and I watched her for hours. Just, she was a busy body while he just lazed around her. Um, but that was a really interesting nest. So that was exciting. We also learn, have learned a lot about their foraging. They like to eat insects in the summer versus the seeds that they eat in winter. Um, so this is a little juvenile fledgling on the right. He likes his little ant. He's getting good at catching. And this is the parent. They can catch lots and lots of insects. The male will take food to the female on the nest and the males also feed the young. So he does take do his part during um, the nesting and fledgling season. 
They love, as you probably all have heard, they love to feed along the snow edges. So a lot of times people say that rosy finches are dependent on snow. Um, you know, they like it as it melts away. They can get at some of the seed, soft seed heads and the insects that are there. This softer material, because it's wetter, may be easier to digest. They may not have to, you know, they can store more and it may not take as much energy to get it through the gizzard and through the stomach. So that may be one of their reasons for preferring this wetter area at the edge of snow. So when we're walking around, this is kind of what we looked for, just these snow fields and look for a rosy finch on the edge of snow. And they also feed just right on top of a snow field. A lot of times that's because air currents will kind of drive the insects and the seeds and just deposit them on the snow fields because of the cold air with the warm air. So they can get access to a lot of easy prey up there on the snow field. So they're pretty common just feeding on the snows. But you also find them away from snow fields. So it's not just like that's all they're using. This bird is out in the open grassy area and there's rocks and you can see there's not even very much snow here and we found a lot of birds in this area. So they don't really have to have that snowy area. They do like to forage on, in the grass and on seed heads of old forbs. And so you can kind of find them anywhere. This one, this is in Dallas Peak in the San Juans and I was, this is where my transect walked and I was like, oh, I'm not gonna find a rosy finch out here. It's dry, it's desolate. They loved this um, bedrock area, and I found a lot of rosy finches using this long ways from snow or water. So they do use a lot of different areas as they're foraging. So that was a lot of um, interesting information we were able to collect. And um, I wasn't sure if they liked to take a drink of water if it was available, but we did catch them drinking, so they do drink when it's available and don't just get their, their um, moisture from snow or their food. Um, we did record predators that we ran into. We didn't see any predation events. I did see a prairie falcon come into where there was a bunch of rosy finches and they flew down and just attacked that prairie falcon. I was like, there are some tough birds. I mean, they really fought them off. But research has shown that um, they have found rosy finch remains in prairie falcon guts. So they probably do take a number of, of rosy finches. Um, there are a lot of long tail weasels up in the Alpine. And I have seen them kind of milling around when there's rosy finches. The rosy finches kind of just ignore them and move on. But like that nest I showed you in the talus area, if this weasel ran into that, I'm sure that would take the eggs and, and uh, not leave anything for the parents. So they could be a potential predator. We've seen um, numbers of ravens in the alpine. I'm not sure if they would be a predator, but they're a common predator for a lot of other bird species. I don't know if they would potentially take a nestling as well or a, or a fledgling. And then we've seen coyotes, and I don't know if they would do a whole lot with rosy finches, but those are kind of the common predators that we've detected doing our rosy finch surveys. Um, we do our surveys, like I said, we want to get a good idea of population <laughs> estimate. So once the young start to fledge, we call it quits. And I found it really interesting. Like I said, we did the surveys in 2018 and 2019. One drought year, one extremely high snow year. The birds started nesting at the same time and started fledging at the same time. So they didn't care if it was snowy or dry. They kind of kept on the same schedule. Different than ptarmigan who kind of wait till enough snow melts to start nesting. These guys were right on the same timeline. So that was really interesting. But once the young birds start fledging, everything just goes crazy. They're just everywhere. Um, here's a couple of youngsters probably hanging out in their nest cliff. This is me watching a bunch of nest, uh, fledglings. And this day, I, I couldn't even count. There were hundreds, just the fledglings feeding, the parents feeding them. So it's just like, we got to call it quits. We can't get any kind of population estimate at that time. What was fun is we did see both the males and females caring for young. Here's a male with his young. And they might split the, um, the, uh, the brood up, because sometimes you just see a male with one and a female with a couple. So they may share and how they're, they're feeding. And this is, oops, gosh, I keep hitting the wrong button, sorry. And this is the female feeding a couple of youngsters right there. When they first fledge, the fledglings are very quiet and just sit on a rock and wait till the parent comes in. But as soon as they're ready to find their own food, they're just noisy and flying around. And it's just super fun to watch if you ever get an opportunity. 
So as far as our population results, um, we're, we have one more year of surveys, so we haven't done a complete analysis. But we did, we're able to survey 52 basins in 2018. We surveyed 40 of those same basins in 2019. All the basins we surveyed in 18 were occupied. Um, and then in 2019, we found four of them that were no longer occupied. Um, the ones that were no longer occupied were ones that had very few birds, so they could be just, you know, subpar habitat, and it just didn't have those few birds inhabiting, inhabiting it last year but we'll see what we come up with this year. And we did get some density estimates. It's very variable depending on the basin, so we'll use those habitat variables to correlate how that impacts the density. And we did a statewide population estimate um, for our modeled habitat in the state, and we actually got about an estimate of 150,000 birds. So we put that as a pretty healthy population at this point in the game. Um, future efforts, we're gonna continue our surveys one more year, um, hopefully. Keep our fingers crossed, this might be more of a normal year, um, so we don't have the extremes that we've dealt with, but who knows. Um, we're gonna continue to characterize these sites, and then we'll take all this information and we'll um, use it to maybe model the impacts of climates and other potential threats we've seen in the Alpine, and then we'll also take it to develop a long-term monitoring program so we can continue to monitor these birds through time. And with that, these are the folks that have helped as technicians, the funding has come a lot from Colorado Parks and Wildlife and UC Santa Cruz. Bird Conservancy has also helped. And these are the folks that have helped with the surveys. And Aaron's gonna thank his crew. Yeah, we've had a lot of people help with our winter work. These are all of our homeowners that have helped us over the, over the years. Jim Barron here is relative of Denali Barron, who I believe is not here, but um, one of the ACES staff. and. Um, We've also had a variety of winter banding volunteers who have come to help us, and um, we've had some good times with them. Here, one day we caught a magpie in one of our traps, and <laughs> he didn't fit very well, but we had fun kind of looking at it. And there's Bruce Ackerman, one of our volunteers, who got his photo taken there. But um, lastly, we want to ask for your help, and this is particularly with that movement piece and those color banded birds. If you have bird feeders out there and you are getting flocks of rosy finches, you know, seeing a banded bird is a big piece of information for us. And um, over the years, we've had a lot of people, you know, send us observations and sightings, and um, it's all been crucial data to our understanding of the species. So if you do have birds or you know somebody who has birds but might not be the most diehard birder or whatnot, let them know. And um, we have an email there, rosy finch reports, that sightings can be sent to. Um, Parks and Wildlife has that link on their website, um, and you can hopefully get in touch with us because we would love to see see where our birds are going and how we can better understand them. And that means even in summer, if you're hiking, you can see the rosy finch looking for a band. Can look in the sun, yes. And I think with that, we're ready for questions. Okay. Here's a question. For you. We've got the front row here. Um, have you guys, um, do you know of any other species that forage on the ground in the snow the way rosy finches do that also experience the snow ice buildup on the um, yeah, the yeah. So for our TV audience, we're going to repeat questions. And this one is about other birds that forage in the snow and ice. Um, May the, in the alpine or otherwise that may experience um, ice on their bands. And what we've found is that there's very little literature about ice accumulation on songbird bands. Um, there's some research on ducks and geese and that kind of thing, and that's why many of them don't receive leg bands or other types of bands. But we have this very unique opportunity to be one of the first people that really gets to explore this question because most often bird banding is done and during migration the bands get on the birds are released and then they head off to the tropics and then they don't come back until the next year we have this opportunity to watch our birds that we just banded and see what they're experiencing so um, as of yet i think amy would say that there's very little work or ptarmigan, as an example, didn't, she didn't see that kind of icing 
on those bands. Um, so this is something that we're kind of both, is a little new to us and we're trying to explore. Any other questions? In the back there? Right, so the question's about re-catching birds and whether we leave those bands on or do we remove them. And at this point, we've left those bands on because we want those behavior observations, right? So if we have a bird with two metal bands on it, we do wanna be able to watch it, observe its behavior, um, and hopefully re-catch it to evaluate its condition. Um, and then the idea is that we can compare a bird with two metal bands, with a bird with a plastic band, with a bird with maybe just has the federal band on it, and then compare those with unbanded birds. So we're toying with the idea of towards the end of our study to start removing bands after we have that, you know, a good sample size in our data that we can draw conclusions from. But we want to take this opportunity to hopefully evaluate these birds and provide some insight for the long term. Yeah, and we think it's important because people do band in cold, wet areas, and Aaron spent a lot of time calling and talking to people. Have you seen this? Do you know about it? And like Aaron said, most of the time you band a bird and it, it's gone, so you don't know the impacts, and we're able to see them come back. So this is really important to, to document so that we can let other researchers know. And like I said, it, it's, it's happened once or twice in the whole time that we've been watching the birds. So... Um, it's not something that happens commonly, but we want to get at the bottom of it so that we can let other people know and then we can know what, how to proceed any further. I, I found this year, some years we have a lot of roses in this other year, maybe just 40, um, but we had a lot of co um, covering where they can um, hang out. Mm -hmm. We um, use a lot of chips so that mm -hmm. they only have the shells on. And this fall, as it stayed warmer, we had a, a big birth of fledglings in late September, mm -hmm. early October. And I got really concerned because then there's a few nights where the temperature really drops mm -hmm. and, and maybe I lost feet or didn't. I couldn't really. F I, I guess the flock left and the, the fledgling <coughs> didn't go with the flock and tried to find a little cozy place to spend the night, but some nights it's just too cold. Yeah. And so I, I, because of the warmer weather, I saw a whole new set of babies that I've never seen that time mm -hmm. of year before. Yeah, um, the, qu I, the question is, um, <laughs> the question, she's just curious about fledglings and when they come down in the year and she had a big flock at her feeder and just wondering having not seen that in previous years um, when the rosy finch well this year from what I saw compared to the prior year was there was a good reproductive output there was a lot of fledglings out there and usually starting about September all the rosy finches start congregating and I'll see flocks of three, 500 birds that just kind of come in together and move out. But the fledglings should be able to feed themselves at that point. And so, um, but they do like to maintain that group so that they can help each other find food. But, um, you know, and there's always gonna be potentially a, a weaker one that doesn't keep up or whatever. But um, yeah, they really like to form these flocks starting in September with the fledglings. But at that time, they should be able to find their own food and, and take care of themselves. And so far from our banding efforts this winter, we are seeing lots and lots of young birds um, in our flocks. And that's something that we hadn't necessarily seen in previous years. So, um, you know, we don't have all the hard numbers yet, but it does seem that, you know, our proportion of young birds is much higher right now. I'm curious, uh, in I know some earlier studies on rosy finches were like dogged by similar problems of the rate of return. And um, there's also this theory about the colonic nature of rosy finches. I, I gather that the lack of rates of return has 
it's not informed your own opinions, and you didn't use that word to describe the populations, but I'm curious if you have an opinion about what um, the pop, like in terms of densities or places where you're seeing, uh, you know, really concentrated populations of birds versus not as many. Um, if you have any theories on what that population looks like. So the, the, the question is about, you know, because rosy finches are so flock dependent in the winter, you know, in the breeding season, I guess, are they kind of colonial in a sense that they congregate in, you know, certain basins or certain cliff areas, and then you might not find them in other areas, I think. Is that what your question is? Yeah, I'm, I'm, you didn't use colonic in, in your presentation, so I'm just curious if you... I guess. Any, uh, like, do you see in the in the alpine? Do you see too much? Or do you think that's a theory that's going to advance, or I guess be just in the alpine? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I I mean, are you just talking about the densities that we see in the different alpine areas? Is that what you? Well, I guess I'm also curious about you know Kim Potter did a study in 2011 mm -hmm. right. and. She abandoned the study because she couldn't get enough rate of return. Right. Right. So I'm curious if you have any idea I, about. I think what we're seeing is that it's, you know, this rate of return and recapture rates, and why we're struggling to get those numbers is because there are 150,000 birds potentially out there, and I th what we're seeing is that the flock that arrives at 9 a.m. is not necessarily the same flock that comes back at noon or 2 p.m. and you know we'll be out there looking at the flock and you'll see one gray crowned rosy finch at 9 a.m. and then at noon there's a black rosy finch in the flock and no gray crowns and you you know you see this different mixing that obviously some birds are different at our feeder at, at any given time so that plus our banding efforts you know we put out 200 bands in a single day at a single location and then that flock comes in at 1 p.m. and there are definitely not 200 bands in that flock, right? It may be 10 or 15 or 20, but it's birds left, birds came back. We don't know which ones left. We don't know which ones came back other than our banding. Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, what the, the hard thing with a, a feeder is you don't even know what your population is. So you don't know where you're drawing birds in and there's also a behavioral difference from some of the research that, that shows you know only dominant birds come to feeders or they can push other subordinate birds off or things like that there's a lot of dynamics going on at a rosy finch feeder and that's one of the reasons we stayed away from any population estimates because we don't even know what the population is is it you know if the one on snow mass how far are those birds coming in and like aaron said do you have certain ones feeding in the morning and they leave and go feed on some native landscape later because a lot of the literature says they like to stay as high as they can and feed on windslip uh, areas and so I don't you know my question is with these addition of feeders what is that impacting their behavior and it's a quick easy food access so it's really hard to get at population numbers and the recapture rates that we've gotten is you know, you don't even get the same bird over and over. The only recaptures is we get one bird one time and then over three years, that's maybe all we ever get to see that bird again. You know, Sandia has been doing this banding for multiple years and they get a lot higher return rates. Yeah. So, um, you know, I can say on the summer breeding areas um, where I don't have banded birds, I don't know individuals, they, you can go back every year I've gone to the same basins and the birds are pretty much in the same areas all the time. So I haven't seen like really areas. So I think it's just, it's a hard thing when you have a nomadic species and they're just looking at it for a feeding frenzy to put on weight and move on. So I don't know if that even <laughs> answers your question. So. No, no, I appreciate your thoughts. Yeah. Okay. I think we've got time for one more question. Okay. Hello. Um, is your project gonna look at climate change and how that might impact the project is going to, oh, so the question was, are we going to look at climate change and, and its in potential impacts to the bird and how long is our project? Um, 
Our project has one more year. I have a graduate student on it right now, Kat Bernier. She's in class right now, so she can be here to present. And we're hoping to maybe see what, what character, what, how we can characterize these higher density breeding areas versus the lower breeding areas and try and predict what climate change may have on these different breeding areas, so what might change. It's pretty difficult in the Alpine because a lot of the spatial layers that we have aren't at a finest scale that we need to depict what a rosy finch actually needs and uses. So it's really difficult, but we're gonna try and attempt it. But like I said, on the winter range, I don't think it's just on the breeding range, it's also on the winter range where they have to come down and find these native feed sources and what could happen to those if we have these extreme droughts and those seed sources aren't there, can that impact them as well? So we're gonna try and tease some of that out, but it's probably gonna be pretty limited. And beside the fact that it's hard to even model climate change for the Alpine. I think that's all the time we have. Thank you. Thank you.